Hello world. Frida Reba Darcy and one Patricia O'Connor here. And I, to my way of thinking, you could not ask for a more beautiful day. Well, maybe you could ask, but asking ain't getting. Uh, it is 64 degrees out and it is sunny and people are out enjoying the pool and it is just you could not ask for a nicer day this is to my way of thinking what great weather looks like so on today's little monday drop we are going to just look over and see how everybody's doing as you can see i've been um doing a little bit of needles there's some carnage there or i've been doing some old needle thinning on this guy as well i don't have the tweezers i'm used to using them uh and it's got quite a few needles in there i need to blow out or brush out or something uh, a lot of this also did by hand but i've just been kind of going through and doing this and pulling out a lot of those those dying back three-year-old needles and the elongated three-year-old needles and that also does works wonders for it's just absolutely cleaning up the tree um, yesterday we did this guy and now uh, sweet pea looks a lot better and uh, it does it just generally looks a whole lot better uh, while I'm here, I guess I might as well give you a little bit of a look at our Kodahan forest. And so far, uh, uh, it's shiny because I put some neem on it yesterday. The reason for the neem is uh, because I was uh, watering something. Oh, I was watering the oak tree and the water was running down the side of the water can and I just completely hosed down without realizing it, just completely hosed down the foliage on the uh, forest. And I thought, yeah, you're asking for trouble and right now things are going so, so well. So I, um, I uh, applied neem. If they're gonna be wet, at least they should be wet with something that will kill bacteria and not invite bacteria. So that was kind of the thinking behind that. I neemed it. And uh, uh, I can't go swinging that stuff around everywhere because, well, for instance, this guy could use a little neem, but I've also got a spider, a leaf hopper in there um, that I should be concerned about. I don't want to go. I don't know that neem will kill him, but it certainly wouldn't. It certainly wouldn't. Uh, make them popular with their buddies smelling like neem and all so yeah i'm a little reluctant to use to use neem on things that i know i've got some uh you know if i'm getting a little bit of pestilence resistance help from uh, a spider which is what i'm calling my leaf hopper uh, then it probably wouldn't be such a a nice thing to do to go nuking him with with something uh, to that extent uh, one of the drawbacks to neem is also that uh, bees do not like it it's not something that's that's good for them also if you're using if you're using ladybugs um, neem isn't a good thing to have around probably you know for a couple of weeks you know uh it's how long you would be seeing it's how long you'd be seeing that residue i don't like using these tweezers i'm gonna go get some better tweezers so i'm gonna continue to do this i'm gonna go for easier needles but um yeah i am i'm gonna change needles those are too wide so started uh, about 
started about a couple, I don't know, maybe the end of last week. Uh, yeah, it was about Friday, I guess, started last week. I started going through and uh, spending my time, usually about 30 minutes before the lights go out, I'll think about doing something, like, I don't know, maybe I'll think about something, doing something leisurely all day and not really get around to it. And then only to uh, realize that our lights are going to be out in 30, 45 minutes. And so I find myself out here and I started removing the old yellow needles. And you know, it looks better when you do that. And it, there's so many of them. Uh, I could bring it in the house and make a night of it and probably and probably still take two or three nights. But um, that's how I'm cleaning this tree up. I'm removing a lot of these third year needles and removing a lot of these yellow needles, making a way for uh, all the newer stuff that's coming along, which I'm happy to say uh, there's a lot of it. This is therapeutic in a lot of ways, too. Now, here's the thing about plucking thinning needles, needle reduction, or cleaning up. Um, this is not really technically needle reduction. Technically, needle reduction is where you decide which is the strongest part of the tree and reduce its needles down to where it's not such a hot shot anymore evening out the energy of the tree so that it more closely resembles uh, maybe the weaker part of the tree. And if, if you uh, don't do that, the weaker part of the tree will continue to get weaker and the stronger part of the tree will continue to get stronger because pine trees want to be big trees. They want to be, they want to be dominant up here. And so if you want to keep them from having dieback in the lower branches and stuff. You need to pick the places where the where the needles are fewer and then reduce up here down to what you see down here. Now, that's on a healthy on a healthy tree that you're growing along. This guy got uh got something really pretty serious this last summer and uh we're not quite out of the woods yet, but for sure, over the next uh, couple of years, I'm not going to be uh, doing any candle cutting. And I probably uh, won't do a lot to try to balance out the energy. What I'm doing right now, though, is cleaning up all these. I'm cleaning up all these dead needles, cleaning out a lot of these dead yellow needles while we have new ones coming in to take their place, making room for them, helping them to, helping them to get all the light they need. And, uh, you know, when you're starting, when I first started learning about pines, um, you get a pine and then you start figuring out what you have to do to keep it looking nice. And while you're learning, it sort of struck me as a lot, you know, it's like, that sounds like a lot of, in, a lot of, it, it right off the bat, off of, it sounds like a lot of work. And I didn't put it this way. I was just kind of like, kind of put off by it without really wanting to think about it too much. Uh, you know, but on the other hand, that's, there's, you know, say how you feel. Uh, and if I thought about it, the justification would be that this is my hobby. You know, why would I want to, uh, why would I want a hobby that I've got to spend a couple of hours doing something that's stressful? Bingo. That was the problem. When it comes right down to it, plucking needles or cutting candles, it's not hard. It's not any harder than popping bubble wrap. You know, but if I were to give you a four foot sheet of bubble wrap and say, if you pop every one of those bubbles in that, I mean, that's gonna take long enough for that to uh, stop being fun and start becoming old, you know, after a couple of minutes. And you've still got four feet square of bubble wrap. To 
But, you know, if, if in doing so you would make your entire, you know, say your living room look better, then you would certainly see where for your effort you got some good out of that. Um, I don't know how great that was as an analogy, but as soon as I began to understand what it was that I was doing or that I was supposed to be doing, then that took the mystery out of it and the mystery, taking the mystery out of it, took the worry out of it. So now I wasn't spending my time doing something stressful, which does remind me of work. The reason I get paid at work is some of it, some of it even when I want to quit because it's kind of stressful at times, I, uh, I get paid to be there and do a professional job. So, you know, you can be totally forgiven for not wanting a hobby that makes you feel that way. It's kind of like why we have hobbies so that we don't have to feel that way. And um, if you're feeling that way about part of this process, it could be that uh, you're not through your learning curve yet, that you're not gonna feel that way. Once you know what you're doing and you go through here with your tweezers and just start plucking at stuff for starters, you suck at it, but then everybody else, whoever did this did too. But the uh, bright side is it only takes it doesn't take very long to get better at it. I mean, I, I, I'm far from good at it, but I guarantee you I'm better at it than I was Friday. And Friday I was better at it than I was uh, however long ago it was that I tried it before then. And uh, at some point, I'm also ambidextrous, so I found that for me, it's just as easy to switch hands as it is to move over. Uh, especially if I'm holding, especially if I'm holding a pen in the other hand, it's like I'm getting better at it because of muscle memory, and I think if I'm holding a pen in the in the other hand, uh, my brain allocates muscle, the same muscle memory to both hands because it thinks I've got tweezers in the other hand and I'm going to jump in any second, with, which is kind of what happens when you get tired of using one hand too long and you want to switch hands. Uh, you uh, would probably stop. I just switch hands. And uh, it didn't take me long. It didn't take me long to adapt with switching hands. The only thing wrong with switching hands while I'm doing uh, videos is, is I've also figured out how I should how I should hold the phone best to f to keep my finger out of it. And it's whenever I deviate from that, then uh, we start we begin to see uh, cameo appearances by Pat's finger in the lens. So. I'm not as good, I'm not as good keeping my finger out of the lens with one hand as I am with the other. But otherwise, uh, I'm, I am as good with tweezers with one hand as I am with the other. So, uh, yeah, so you can uh, really make time stand still by doing this or you think it does and then you get your head out of the clouds and it's the next day or something not quite that bad I, mean, I kid I kid but uh, this is uh, you get better at picking out the ones that you're actually aiming for and not and not shooting the innocent as they say and uh, and you get faster. And this is a lot faster than I was doing it. I've, I have seen people in videos that like do this for a living and they're like ding, 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 ding. And the needles are just flying. And you know, 30 minutes of that and they would probably have really make a marked difference on this tree. But even then, it would still take more than that to finish this guy.
and I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to do that uh, I'm not gonna do that to you guys but I am going to go through here while I am here and take out some of the bad but that's kind of what I've been doing um, the tree had a lot of dieback on some of the on some of the tips because of our infestation of whatever the heck that was but as you can see all the little candles are starting to show better now that I uh, pull back a lot of that and then some of the other stuff which is elongated right it wasn't it wasn't that long before it just elongated well it's time for that stuff to go and it's a lot easier to uh, to pull out than those same needles would have been when they were younger and shorter so and whenever you do that uh, overall you begin to change the uh, basic shade of the tree with every yellow needle and with every green needle you leave and every yellow needle you pluck uh, the tree gets to return back to that healthy color and um, we make room for the new while we are uh, taking out the old so yeah but the good news is uh, I get to take a break from candle pruning this guy uh, I will be candle pruning this one and I will be doing the same thing that I'm doing to this one I'll be doing uh, to this one in fact I've already started some lot and uh, my two-year-old uh, so yeah that's what's going on there I'll be doing uh, more of that on uh, this is just me being casual and killing killing a plucking a few of these needles because that's what I have been casually doing for the last couple of days uh, we will be doing more stuff uh, with the bonsai tables in other words i'll be bringing a tree in and doing this and that in a, a, a little bit longer a little bit m uh, more informative measure than me just killing a few minutes plucking needles while i uh, have got everybody here but don't be intimidated by plucking needles once you figure out once you figure out that you're not going to go pulling limbs off of your tree and once you figure out that the older that the ones you're supposed to pluck are um, pretty easy to see once you've looked at the tree for a minute or a couple of years. Uh, all of that becomes less intimidating. And once the job stops being intimidating, it actually becomes more pleasurable like the other jobs in bonsai that uh, you enjoy doing, like pinching or uh, putting motion in branches or uh, pruning tips or you know any of that stuff so uh, that was one thing that uh, a lot of times my looking at uh, Japanese black pine and looking at the needle reduction and looking at the candle pruning and all of that and thinking to myself that's a lot of work part of that feeling of that being a lot of work comes with the uneasiness of not knowing what you're doing when you're thinking about doing all of that stuff. Later, it won't seem like a lot of work. It'll seem like something pleasurable to do because you, it's kind of automatic. You know what you're doing and you just kind of dive in and start doing it. I kind of, to this day, still have that same feeling about, uh, about the maples. Maybe not so much the trident, but the regular Japanese maples. They're just the whole logic counter logic about all of this is going great so we got to thin this back or cut our leaves in half or do something and if we don't do that all the stuff inside will die back right now i'm letting that guy go with it knowing that i have tons to learn and for the sole reason that uh, a lot of this stuff is growing out of parts of the tree that we've already discussed before i've got future plans for those for those three trunks that didn't really include a lot of the stuff we see here anyway and without just jumping back and forth you know it's it's a little bit of the same thing i find what i don't know about maples to make the stuff you do to maples seem intimidating not because it's a lot of work but because i don't know what they're doing when i see people doing some of those things uh 
it strikes me as a lot of work because I don't know what they're doing. Once you kind of figure out what you're supposed to be doing, it's fun. It's fun to park one of these. It's fun to park a pine tree on the bench and, you know, hang out with tweezers and just start kind of pulling off the things that need to come off while you're doing so. Um, it's kind of like popping bubble wrap and having your living room look better because of it. That's kind of, that analogy is kind of where that was winding its way to. So, yeah. And we're seeing a lot more back buds on the cork bark oak. It's just been back budding its uh, butt off while we're looking at things and talking about pines. We have flushes of new needles coming out on uh, this ponderosa, which is uh, a pongo I have lovingly named pongo. Uh, I think I'm showing you those those new needles coming in. I may not. I may be showing you uh, God knows what. I can't see the screen from the angle I was at. But, uh, yeah, really nice looking branch work on this. The, the uh, person I got this tree from uh, really were on their wiring game and I appreciate daily, I appreciate the work they did on this ponderosa pine. And uh, unlike the Japanese black pine, which like I said, I'm no longer as intimidated. It's nice on, on days to just Take a small tree on the bench and take out your, it's almost like, you know, snacking or something, just sitting there plucking away with those needles. But this one is a little different than that. What its regiment will do is, and as you can see, it's sparse on the ends, and it is very literati looking uh, and kind of lacy and sparse on the ends, like I said. But what we are going to do is uh, put it through a little bit of growth changes in the next couple of years. Let's look all the way down at that part. And working our way up from that trunk into, you can see how that bark is just layered. And we've got that twist. You can see how the tree just kind of twists and winds the way they do. Even in the bark, you can still kind of see that corkscrew motion in the bark as this tree just winds its way right on up. And whenever it has these little places where it splits or cracks with growth, this very slow moving honey colored sap comes up and it smells like butterscotch. Um, and then you can kind of still see that it's spinning and twisting in its direction in the way that it was growing. These trees are so awesome. But what we're going to do with this is totally different than what I would do with my Japanese black pine where you do your needle reduction and you do your uh, uh, thinning of needles reduction, you know, to balance the energy and you uh, cut candles and you uh, mind when you feed it and you do it. What we're going to do with this is just the opposite. We are going to, it right now, it's getting fed. And for the, for the end of winter, all the way into the beginning of spring, throughout until fall, we are going to feed this tree and give it all the water that it needs. And we're going to do everything we can do to encourage more back buds. And then when those back buds come out, we will be continuing to, um, welcome them into the world with open arms and feed them and our increased needle count and uh, encourage all of that photosynthesis and all of that strength and that in and in so doing we will get even more back buds and um, at some point the tree will have more needles than it can sustain at its current needle length uh, based on how much energy it can hold in this in this size container with X amount of roots. And it's at that point that we begin to see a little bit of needle length reduction. 
I'm happy with the current uh, needle length. And that's not really why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because this is a healthier way for me to grow this Pondo, uh, Hondo the Pondo. This is a healthier way for the tree. And I hope once everything flushes out and gets full out and gets healthier and gets its second wind going and the needles get along, I hope that I can basically get them back to the same length they are now. And it'll be at that point that we'll go through with our scissors and cut a little off the ends to try to reduce reduce the height and the length of those ends but we will have fuller tips to the end of the tree where that's been the way of the tree to grow throughout its first 175 years was sparse and lean and hanging in there so in the last several years since collection it's had its root mass reduced it's had its tap roof um, removed and it's had its ability to have its little kind of ace in the hole and them long roots that would have been winding down in between the cro uh, cracks in the rock. It's lost that and it depends on uh, me slash us now. So uh, I could just feed it and water it just enough to supplement what it lost and and be really just really have be God's gift to uh, what conditions were when it grew up and how to uh, counter that for its pot or or we can say you're in Alameda now and we're not going to be able to uh, we're not going to be able to replicate uh, minus 14 degrees and we're not going to be able to replicate uh, 5,000 800 feet. That's roughly where the damn plains are that you see in the video here. That's how high that tree was used to growing. Um, and yeah, I know uh, planes fly 20,000 feet, but the airport's between us and the horizon. And when you see them, they're still got landing gear. And I think they're probably four or 5,000 feet off the ground. And this guy, this guy came from a place higher than that. That just blows my mind. But, so yeah, I can't replicate all of that, but what I can do is give it uh, enough water to keep it healthy. I can give it uh, a low dose of uh, constant fertilizer to, uh, so that it can meet all of its nutritional needs. And I can make sure that whether or not it's part of the country goes where it came from, if its old neighborhood goes through a drought or 18 feet of snow or whatever, that where this tree is, it is given what it needs to survive and thrive. And um, that is sustainable in a way that my trying to mimic Deadwood, South Dakota, 58,000 feet is not, um, if you get my drift. So that is how that's going. It's So far it's working well on this tree. I showed you a little bit, I kind of swung out there with the lens I think and showed you um, and let you see the new growth on the needles and those little pollen goodies that are coming out. This is its, This is the young one that was collected from the same neighborhood. It's a 26 year old uh, Pondo uh, named Hoss and it was also collected at the same elevation about the same neighborhood. It could use a little dead needle reduction but I'm not in a super big hurry. Uh, some of these are not necessarily ready to go out. They are, uh, they may have gotten damaged in shipping. Uh, some of them are uh, brown all the way back to the sheath or the cuticle. They're on the way out and I could, I could like do that tonight over a movie or something. Uh, watch, uh, watch a little movie and do a little uh, pay close attention needle maintenance to this guy but it also is looking really healthy and you can see those little green waxy tips coming out there greeting Alameda saying hello this is house here and uh, 26 years old was the date given to me on this tree and you can kind of see that I guess uh, when I got my uh, black pine, 
I was told if they have to be X number of years old to have bark, they have to be X number of years old for that bark to encompass the trunk. They have to be X number of years older for that bark to uh, start encroaching on uh, the branches. And uh, it's X number of years older if that uh, branching then uh, bark encompasses uh, the limbs and the branches and the twigs and stuff. So those are all indications of uh, markers of age, none of which I would swear to be uh, on top of when it comes to ponderosas. But I was told uh, how that worked on uh, the Japanese black pine. So, uh, you know, that's kind of how, that's kind of how you can do the little litmus test if somebody tells you that their tree is a bazillion years old. You can kind of look. Uh, there are ways to tell whether or not it's an adolescent or a teenager or an elderly or an elderly tree. And this one has all the hallmarks of being uh, what I was told uh, time-wise. Look at the rollover on that, on that, uh, on that feature of the tree where it has been hollowed or whether it got a uh, branch got stripped or something and it's just rolled over that's just, that's just neat as all get out to me the way that does that this tree is uh when i got this i loved this tree more than i thought i would and i was like man oh man do not mess up when it comes to this you really have to figure out a few a few things when it comes to this tree because you don't know what you're doing but you better figure it out fast that is the way that uh hoss affected me when i got it and i also felt a little under the gun because of the um issue that i had had with shipping that just really stressed me out to think that uh, i was holding a tree that probably was needed intensive care and uh instead it had it had me and uh I was more hopeful than knowledgeable, but uh, ponderosas are hardy and tough, and uh, totally, totally got away with that. So yeah, that's our little ponderosas, uh, and that is the uh, that is the Japanese black pine that we did yesterday after after we uh, got rid of all those ridiculously long long but just straggly few it kind of that's why i call it pig pen it looked kind of like pig pen's hair to me the way those needles those few needles were uh laying out on different sides of the tree really really long so yeah i think that looks a lot better i think this is looking we did this just was just since I was here. This is already looking a lot better. I keep cleaning on it, and all of those uh, all of those candles flush out, and we'll be getting our cork bark back into shape here in no time. The uh, cypress trees are doing very well, as they tend to do. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot going on right now with them. It is uh, our part right now what we're doing is watering them and feeding them and enjoying them those are the little uh fertilizer pellet that's bio gold which uh, was a tip that i was given uh six or seven months ago i think and since then i was watching uh some other videos i think by ryan neal involving feeding and fertilizing and uh, and so I was happy to see that they were using the same thing I was using. So I was able to equate their numbers directly and kind of get the most out of it. That little baby is not happy in a hot tub and not happy about it. Well, uh, We all have different ideas, I guess, about, about what's par what's paradise. So.
Oh, but the breeze is really nice. Yeah, you can kind of see. And we're still like, oh, I was just looking a little while ago. That's, uh, we're getting 20, 20 mile an hour gusts still up here. But it's not really, really super hard. It feels pretty nice all in all. And with that, that's going to be us. Our next drop will be our Wednesday drop. And uh, well, there's no telling what we'll be doing on our Wednesday drop. Like and subscribe if you have not already. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching.